Okay, you can turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. We're in chapter 4 this week. Continuing our expository studies of the book of Ephesians. And uh, every verse of Scripture in the Bible is important. And there are so many truths within the pages of this book. Uh, no other holy book out there can even come close to comparing to the King James Bible. But let's start out here. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. It says here, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Let me ask you a question. What is your vocation for Jesus Christ? You say, well, brother, we all have to be soul winning. We all have to be soul winners out there every week, winning hundreds of souls to the Lord and all this other stuff. Well, we all are ambassadors for Jesus Christ, but we don't always have the same vocation. There are some of us that are better at soul winning, some of us that aren't quite as good. We should all try to. I mean, it should be a thing of witnessing to people. That's fine. But the fact is, we all have different gifts from the Lord. You know, turn in your Bible, keep your hand there in Ephesians because we'll be coming right back to it, but you can turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Of course, I've talked about this in a lot of the different studies, but it's always good to do a refresher here and go back over it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 21 it says here, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing because I said we don't all have the same um, office, the same vocation, so to speak, but we all do have that ministry of reconciliation. We can all tell somebody what Jesus Christ did for us and what the Lord can do for them. So that is there. And we're not going to read this whole chapter here, but if you want to see a chapter on the thing of spiritual gifts, read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You know, and you go down through here and, uh, you know, it's they're just verse after verse after verse talking about these different vocations that you can do for the Lord. And, of course, a vocation is just another word for, like, your job, your career, whatever, you know. So go back to Ephesians chapter 4. And, you know, the Bible says there in verse 1, Beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. That's also very convicting. We have to make sure that we are walking worthy of that vocation, of whatever talents and gifts the Lord has given us. We have to make sure that we are using those for the Lord. But look at verse 2. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Okay? And I've said it many times in the past, and I'll say it one more time, and that is, we are designed to fight. You are a, a called into a, the army for Jesus Christ. You are called to be a soldier. Okay? The Bible talks about warring a good warfare. All right? So, you're going to fight somebody. And if you're not out there fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil, you're going to fight other brethren. Be fighting amongst ourselves. Fighting and devouring one another. Like the Bible talks about. Okay. We should endeavor, right there in verse 3, it says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That doesn't mean keeping the unity between lost and saved. Let's be ecumenical and join with the Catholics and join with the Buddhists and the Hindus. And the... No, 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 no. That's not what it's talking about there. Because why? They don't have the Spirit in the bond of peace. They don't have the Holy Spirit within them. So you can't be unified with people like that. But there are things, Romans chapter 14 talks about some of the liberty that we have, some of the things of not judging another man because he wants to celebrate a holiday and you don't want to, or he wants to eat a certain thing and you don't want to. 
there are issues of liberty within the body of Christ. And we should think about that liberty and then endeavor to keep the unity, you know, as it says here, of the spirit and the bond of peace. Uh, don't always have to be right. You don't always have to be right with people. Okay? You can have your opinion. You can be. You can express your opinion. But if they disagree with you, if it's not a major doctrinal issue, if it's an issue of liberty, well, then, whatever. Let it go. Look at verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. I remember one of the new versions, I forget which one it is, but they say it, it takes out you. So it says there in the last part of verse 6, and in all, which is pantheism, God in everything. God is in the rocks, God is in the trees, God is in the breeze, God is in the rain, God is in each of us. That's pantheism. That's not what the Bible teaches. When it says, and in you all, it's talking about saved people. Okay? And it's interesting there too because it says, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. So people say Jesus Christ is not God. Uh, well, that's a problem because otherwise, other places in Scripture it says that Christ is in us. So here you have God, the Father, being in us. So if Jesus Christ is not God the Father, how do you reconcile that? You say it's a contradiction. Well, it's a contradiction in your understanding of Scripture, but not a contradiction in the Bible. The Bible lines up. Jesus Christ is God and always has been and always will be. But um, one thing that you're going to run into, if you haven't already, you'll run into some of these people that say that there are multiple bodies of believers. They reject the thing of the what they call the universal church because Catholicism teaches that and they say, well, Catholicism teaches it, so it must be wrong. Um, no, that's not the standard. The standard is, does the Bible teach it? And the Bible teaches that there is one body. You say, how do you know? Just read it. Verse 4, there is one body. One body. One. Hyperdispensationalism says, oh no, there's two bodies. You know, there's the body of, of Christ that was there from the resurrection to Paul, and then you have the other body that's there from Paul to the rapture. No, there's one. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 16, he says, names a couple of people, and he says, who were in Christ before me. In Christ, before me. They're part of the same body. See? You also have um, this uh, Baptist bride heresy, which I need to do a sermon on that sometime, but the Baptist brighter heresy, and they'll come out with the thing of, of many bodies and things like this, and you have the Baptists are the bride of Christ, and then other churches are not. You know, they're, they're not part of the bride, they're just kind of guests at the wedding or something like this. It, just a bunch of foolish nonsense. I went back and forth and back and forth with this guy about this thing of one body versus, you know, many. And I just kept showing this verse, and over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, again, there it talks about many members and having different, you know, offices, different gifts and things, or vocations like we just read in verse 1. There's a lot of different people within the body of Christ, but it's all just one body. So there's no such thing as saying, you know, my church is better than your church. You know, just imagine I have a group here and things, not a building, but I just have a group here of people, and I say our church is different than your church. No, that's not correct. We're all part of the same church. You know. So, there's only one. And of course you have local congregants of believers and things like that. And you can say, well, you know, the churches are basically when you have Christians getting together, then that forms a church. You know, and whatever. Okay, you can make that argument, but it's still just one body. You're not part of some other body of Christ than I am. Okay, if you're saved, you're part of the same body as me. Don't let anybody tell you, teach you, or talk you out of that belief. And I want to show you here, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You can go back there again. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read just a few verses here to, to further back this thing up here that we just read in Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. It says here, For as the body is one... 
and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be, whether we be bond or free, whether and, and have all been made and have been all made, excuse me, to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Okay, so there are many members, but one body. Okay, um, there are many parts to my body right now. Look, ten fingers. Okay, two hands, two arms, two eyes, two ears, one nose, one mouth. You know, see? But it's just one body. So it is with Christ. Don't forget that. Turn next, or turn back to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 7. Okay, it says here, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Okay? And, you know, there again, there are some people that go through rougher times and they have a rougher situation. They might not have as much money. They might have some kind of sickness or, or uh, physical um, problem or, or whatever. And God will he'll, he'll dish out grace according to that. God's not going to just expect more of you than you're able physically to do. Uh, you also have to keep that in mind. But now let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. First Corinthians ten thirteen. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Alright? So that's very instructive because number one, it's encouraging. Because God will not allow you to be tempted. He will not allow you to be attacked by Satan above that you're able to bear. That's a good thing. But it's also a bad thing. You say, what? Huh? what are you talking about? Why is that a bad thing? Well, think about it. If you sin, if you mess up, there's only one person that can be blamed for it. Yourself. You can't say, God, you didn't protect me from that. God knows how much you can take. He won't suffer you to be tempted above that you're able to bear. So if you succumb to temptation, it wasn't because God allowed the devil to push you too far. Uh -uh. It's because you gave in. Convicting, isn't it? Very convicting. I'm not just talking to you, I'm talking to myself too on that one. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Wherefore... He saith, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it first or was it what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that has descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Okay, now you can do a big study on that, and I I have a study out on it. I'm trying to think of what it is. Something about the resurrection. I don't remember what right now, but just type in the resurrection. You'll see the thing about, um, I think, World Testament saints. Did they go straight to heaven or something? I, f I forget how I have it titled, but I don't have it written in my notes here. But the point is, back in the Old Testament, they did not have a perfect sacrifice to pay for their sins. They only had the blood of bulls and goats. And those sin that sacrifice system could not take away sin. It could cover it, but it couldn't take it away. So when they died, they went down into the earth, down to a place called Abraham's bosom. You read about in, in uh, Luke chapter 6, where it talks about the rich man being in hell. And in hell, he lifts up his eyes and he looks over and he sees Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. Okay, so you, you, we just you know, call that place Abraham's bosom. And you know, he says, send Lazarus over here to dip his, you know, dip his finger in some water and have him come over here and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. And Abraham says, no, he can't. Uh, first of all, we can't do that. Secondly, even if we wanted to, there's a huge gulf between us and you. So we can't pass over to you, and you can't pass over to here. So there was a place where the Old Testament saints went when they went down there in the earth, the heart of the earth. That does not happen anymore. 
Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ now can pay for your sins. It covers them, it takes them away completely. So they're erased. So when you die, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You know, that's the way it is. Your soul and your spirit go to be with the Lord. Your body's going to stay on the earth until the rapture. That's how it works right now for a New Testament Christian. Okay. Uh, look at the... Oh, and, and what it says there, the thing about, you know, uh, captivity. He led captivity captive, captive and gave gifts unto men. You know, what is that? Well, that's when Jesus Christ came up from the dead. He led captivity captive, those that were the Old Testament saints that were held captive, so to speak, down in the earth waiting for that perfect sacrifice. He led them up to heaven and he gave gifts to men. What were the gifts? Well, what's your vocation? See? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Those are the gifts that the Lord gave you. Now, let's continue here. We'll read about some of these. Verse 11 through 13. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's why I believe that what's really going to trigger the rapture is when that last soul gets saved. Because then we will complete the body of Christ. You say, explain that all to me there, Brian. I don't quite understand it. I don't either. Sorry, I can't explain it. Um, I don't understand exactly how this thing is going to work out. Uh, how many people have to get saved? <sighs> Excuse me. How many people have to get saved before the body of Christ is complete? I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. Um, not really sure. But it says right there in verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, perfect and complete in other words there, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Interesting because if you read Back in um, Romans chapter 11, it talks about until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. You know, that the, the Jews are basically put away until that fullness comes in, and then all Israel is saved after that. Now, if you want, you know, the way that that thing should be interpreted, it's basically right here, when the body of Christ is complete, both Jews and Gentiles, when they're, when they're saved and the body of Christ is complete, we leave... The man of sin shows up. That's why it says, He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Okay? Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is where you can find that. And that passage there is talking about the body of Christ. When the body of Christ, we are letting, we are hindering, stopping the Antichrist from showing up. But when we leave, now the Antichrist can show up. Okay? So, the thing that's preventing that from happening is, there's still parts of the body of Christ that have not been filled yet. Okay, there are still people that need to be saved. That's why, it's so funny, these post-tribbers, you know, they, they just say, the pre-trib rapture makes for weak Christians. No, the pre-trib rapture makes for strong Christians, those that really understand everything. Because if you think to yourself, the Lord could be coming back here in, at any minute and taking us out of here, the body of Christ being removed, you know, you look at the world a lot differently than if you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to be here for at least another seven years, you know, or three and a half if you're mid-trib, you know. So it leads to a much holier life if you're pre-trib. And I realize that there are some of these modern lost people that call themselves Christians, and they're going out and they're saying, you know, well, there's going to be a rapture, so I don't need to do anything or need to prepare for rough times or whatever else. You know, sure, there's people who are there. But a lot of those people aren't even saved, too. So just watch out for some of this stuff that's coming out of these false false uh, teachers and ministries and things. But um, next we're going to look here at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So, Brian, how do we, I don't understand, how are we supposed to keep unity with people that we don't like? Of course, I don't, I don't, you know, I can't really relate because, uh, you know, everybody likes me and I like everybody, so. 
Just kidding. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9 through 13. If you want to know how to keep uh, unity. It says here, For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. The best way to keep peace among the brethren and unity among the brethren is for you to have charity for people. Self-sacrificing for other people. All right. Look at uh, Colossians chapter 3. Back past Ephesians there. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. It says here, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another. In other words, putting up with each other. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. You want to be Christ-like? Then forgive other people. Verse 14, And above all these things put on charity. Like we just read over there in 1 Corinthians 13, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. There we see it again. And be ye thankful. Okay? If you're not getting along with other Christians, and I realize, you know, that right now we are like majorly into the great falling away. There's there's so many people are just believing so many weird things and whatever else. It's not always easy to get along with some of the other brethren. Okay. But I'm talking about real true Bible believing brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, if you're having a hard time getting along with them, you need to go down through that list there in Colossians chapter 3, verses uh, 12 through 15. Go down through that and see how you stack up to those standards right there. Are you doing those things? Do you have charity? Something to think about. Go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. Okay, it says here that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love which or may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. Hmm. You know one of the easiest ways to tell if somebody's a child or not? What's their attention span like? You say they're Verse 14, about children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Uh, it's very funny to watch a child. You get these young children and things, and I had quite a few nephews and nieces over the years, so I got to experience it firsthand. But you get these young children, and you'll see them, and they'll be playing with this thing and whatever else, and all of a sudden they just, boom, they stop it and they go on and they do something else. I'm going to be a firefighter, and they're playing that they're a firefighter, and just like that, I'm going to be a police officer. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a this. I'm going to be a that. You say, well, how's that work out with spiritual things? Well, I believe the King James Bible is the inspired perfect Word of God. Well, what's this? James White. Hmm. Huh. I believe the King James Bible is a good translation, but it's definitely not inspired, and actually the new versions are more accurate in many places, and the Nestle text is, is much better than the King James. In fact, we really shouldn't use the King James because it's, uh, it's, it's archaic and difficult for people to understand, and we're not going to win many lost people to the Lord if we do. Oh, what's, what's this book? Oh, uh, you know, a book here on the understanding the history of the Bible by... Um, an understandable history of the Bible by Sam Gipp. Oh, okay. Oh. Well, I do believe the King James Bible is God's Word. Now, I reject what James White said, but um, I, I do believe it's the Word of God, and, and I, I, I think it's definitely the most historically accurate and probably the most blessed and whatever, but I don't totally agree with Dr. Sam Gipp. And I, I don't know, uh, not really sure. Somebody hands you another book. 
Oh, well, I think it is the Word of God, but it's probably not inspired. Somebody hands you another book. Well, actually, the one manuscript here, I, I mean, I really have to rely on Greek and Hebrew. And See, what is that? It's a child. They're just to and fro, tossed to and fro. It says they're carried about with every wind of doctrine. Now, I'll grant you, you know, if you're wrong in something, well, then, yeah, you do need to change. Somebody shows you a verse or shows you a bunch of scriptures and things like that, and you say, oh, man, yeah, okay, I was wrong. Then you need to change. But this thing of just flip-flopping all the time, and, and I, well, I used to believe, but and then I believed it differently, and then I went back to believing, and then, I, and then you're dealing with a child. And, you know, you're going to do that somewhat as a new Christian. All right, don't, don't think that you're just going to have your doctrine just squared away because I listen to Brian Denlinger. I'm going to have 100% pure, perfect doctrine. I never have to disagree with him because he's, he's our leader. He's right 100% of the time. That's not going to happen. Okay, uh, I'm not so deceived as to think that I have always said everything ex cathedra, perfect, infallible. I'm not deceived into thinking that. Uh, there are going to be times I'm going to mess up. There are going to be times that... that uh, you're going to probably see some things that where I make a mistake. You know, I've said that before. I have I have never ever told people that I'm the authority. I always say there's a book that you can hold in your hands that is God's word. I mean, whatever you want to say about this book, you know, um, well, is it really truly inspired? Is it double inspiration? Is it this? Is it it's just God's word. It was all this fancy terminology. Is it the infallible, inspired, inerrant, plenarily, and you know, all this, and verbally, plenarily, all the, huh? I don't care. I don't care what it, it's the word of God. Okay, you want to go back to the translation team there, the men, the scholars, the fifty-four, and then it went down to forty-seven over the years. Those men that did that took seven years to translate this book right here. God was present there at that. He didn't have to somehow get rid of the original writings and things and now the originals are no good anymore and only the King James. I don't teach that. All I simply say is this book, God had a hand in creating this book for the English speaking people. And I believe that it is a living book because God has used this book and, and shown me amazing things and shown a lot of you amazing things too through the pages of this book. That's what inspiration means. Okay, inspiration is not like that. That's expiration. You're breathing out. Inspiration is breathed in. Okay, and when God breathes into the nostrils of something, the breath of life, it becomes living. And I believe that this book is living. Doesn't mean that I get, come down in the middle of the night and it's, it's in the refrigerator getting something to eat, you know, okay? It doesn't mean that. What it means is this book will tell you what's going on in your life. This book, when you start to mess around with sin, God will bring some scriptures to your mind. How many times does that happen to you? Happened to me all the time. You'll be reading and you're you know, doing some morning reading and stuff, you know, devotional reading or whatever, and, you, and all of a sudden it's like you come across a verse and it's like, jab, you know, it's like a little sword sticking in you, which is what the Bible says about itself. In the book of Hebrews, you know, it's, a, it's likened to a sword. It's really something. This book is a living book. That's why it's so important to understand that. And if you're a child, spiritually speaking, you will flip-flop and go all over the place. You won't say, I'm sorry, the Bible's my authority, and I'm just going to study the Bible. I'm going to study to show myself to approve unto God. You know, you're going to be flip-flopping all over the place, and well, I used to believe, and then I don't believe, and then, you know, and you're going to look for men like me to be your final authority. And then when I fail you, when I fail your expectations, then you're going to get upset and you're going to go to find some other teacher and you're going to worship him for a while till he fails you and then you're going to go look for another teacher and then you're going to... You might as well just get it settled. Just believe the book. Learn from different preachers out there. You know, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. Okay? Many different preachers. Those things you learn and you say, okay... 
brother so-and-so, oh yeah, he's good here and here and here, but I don't agree with him in this point and that point and that point because I have a Bible. I have a perfect standard. Look at Galatians chapter 4. You say, what's going to happen to me if, if I uh, have this thing of, of absolute truth? I believe in absolute truth. Not being a child carrying it, carried about with every wind of doctrine and every little thing tossed to and fro. What's going to happen to me? What am I going to be labeled as? Well, Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? You'll become the enemy of a lot of different people. Why? You tell them the truth. You say, well, I don't care whatever you want to say about the King James Bible. It's God's book. I don't need your Greek. I don't need your Hebrew. I have a King James Bible. You will become the enemy of a lot of people. A lot of children. You know, if you want to see a child throw a fit, just say, I want you to sit there and, and we're going to do this one thing for all day. Or whatever. Most children will throw a fit. Why? Because they're a child. They don't have the mind yet that's developed. They haven't matured to the point where they can sit down and focus on one task. They are carried about with every wind of doctrine. But let's go back to our text here. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. From whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. Like the old hymn says, and what is that, that tie that binds us together? Well, it's the blood of Jesus Christ. That blood that He shed, that ultimate sacrifice that He paid on the cross. And we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. The Bible says that if any man come after me, Jesus said, you know, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Yeah, we are to crucify ourselves. self Sacrifice. What is self-sacrifice? Charity. What is charity? The bond of perfectness. How we keep unity among the brethren? By having charity. By not always having to prove yourself to be the most spiritual of the bunch. By putting yourself down to lift other people up. You see? That's how the whole thing works, brethren. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 through 19. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. You know one of the most pathetic things that there is in this world? Men and women in their 70s that are still partying like teenagers? You say, well, what are you talking about? They give themselves over to lasciviousness, being past feeling, and they are alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. You know? What are you going to do this weekend? I want to get stone cold drunk, man. I'm just going to drink myself into a stupor. Hey, man, why don't you read the Bible? Read the Bible. That's dull, man. That's boring. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, why don't you read the Bible? Why don't you get saved and go out and witness to people? Make it a goal that you know you can go out and, and uh, pass out some tracts. Put out some tracts in different places. Go to different stores and put some tracts out there. Whatever. It's exciting. It's not a dull life. And hey, let's, let's just be real uh, carnal here for a minute. Why don't you just go out and enjoy nature? Just go take a walk through the woods and just be like, wow, look at all the Lord made. Isn't this amazing? If you're married and have, have children and things, wife and kids, let's, let's go on out and just have a picnic. Let's go out and go swimming at the, at the uh, lake down there. or Let's go fishing or let's go kayaking, canoeing. Let's hike. Let's do whatever. Enjoy what God made. Ah, man, I'd... You know, get these people, oh, I'd rather just stay home, man, get drunk. I know a lot of people like that. Very, very sad. And they have given themselves over unto lasciviousness 
and they work all uncleanness with greediness. How very sad. Luke chapter 12. Turn over to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 12, verse 33. Thirty-three and thirty-four. It says here, "Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure, treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also." You know, there's an old saying, and I've talked about this, of course, many times in my studies. But they say, "Don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good." I always thought that that was the dumbest thing that people could say. Because it's the exact opposite. Don't be so earthly minded that you're no heavenly good. You know, don't waste all your life down here getting your house to look just perfect and making sure. I mean, I've known professing Christians that'll wash and wax their vehicle every weekend. You know, just keep their sport utility vehicle or their pickup truck or something just looking spotless, just brand new looking and everything else. Why? What do you think is going to happen to that thing at the rapture? You think somebody's going to come along, the, the police or a bunch of thieves or whoever else is going to come along, and they're going to say, oh, this is the property of Brian Denlinger. I, I, he probably went up at the rapture, so we'll just put it in a special little garage with his keys and everything and make sure it's clean when he comes back in seven years. I don't think so. You know, whatever you have, if it's not your relatives that go through it, it's going to be a thief or the law, the police. They're going to be eating your food in your refrigerator and going through, rummaging through your personal belongings. Think about that. You say, well, uh, I don't like the thought of that. Well, then you probably ought to try and, and get the kind of treasures that, that uh, rust isn't going to mess up and, and thieves aren't going to be able to break through and steal and the moth isn't going to be able to eat. You say, what kind of thing is like that? Oh, uh, well, spiritual things. Things that you can lay up in heaven. You know, um, for most of my life, I didn't do a thing for the Lord. Uh, the, over half of my life, I was lost. And when I finally did get saved, uh, it went for quite a few years before I started to actually serve the Lord. Uh, most of my life, I've wasted. But uh, I thank the Lord that, that He has given me a ministry, that He bears fruit through this ministry. And now I have something to look forward to when I get to heaven. I can say, I, you know, I'll have some treasure up there in heaven. How much? I don't know. But I know that there will be something up there. There will be some. There's you know, going to be some riches that I have in heaven. This down here? You know, thieves are going to get it. Whatever. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Turn back in your Bible that are 1 Timothy chapter 6. So I don't know, Brian. I, I just really think my career is important and just really, really working to try and get that new car that they just came out with here and the new 2015 whatever vehicle. Let's look about this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 12 says here, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee! These things. Don't be so concerned about your career and all the other things, money, 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 and stuff like that. Flee those things. Be content with what you have. And follow after righteousness, goodness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. That's what we're supposed to do as Christians. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 
Verse 20 and 21 says here, But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Okay. Um, what was Jesus Christ when he was here on the earth? You say, well, he was God manifest in the flesh. Yeah, but I mean physically. Physically. What was Jesus? Um, a homeless, unemployed carpenter, essentially. And a Jew on top of that. Not a very popular kindred at the time. Hmm. So you have these people that give themselves over to lasciviousness and uncleanness and you know, all this other stuff. They're worldly, they're partying, they're doing all this stuff, and they're they're all concerned about money and everything else. And Paul says, You didn't learn that from Christ. If you're messing around with those worldly things, you have not so learned Christ. You didn't get that from your Savior. You want to be Christ like you know, the Bible talks about, you know, there's there's he that maketh himself poor yet hath great riches. You know? Yeah. Something to think about for eternity. Look at uh, Luke chapter 9. You can keep your hand here in Ephesians chapter 4 because we're going to be coming right back to it. But go to Luke chapter 9. Say, well, I just want to, I want to follow the Lord. I want to, Definitely, you know, be found faithful. Okay? Fortunately, the Bible tells you what it's going to cost you. Luke chapter 9, verse 57 and 58. It says here, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head Hmm. Are you ready? Are you ready to follow Jesus, even if it means you might one day not have a place to stay? Have you counted the cost? Would you be willing to go to prison for the Lord? Would you be willing to have them come, the? Jesuitical Catholic government come along and uh, take everything that you have, confiscate everything, put you in prison someplace? The rough questions to think about. Not easy to answer either. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 through 24. It says here that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Okay, now I have a whole sermon on uh, the subject of uh, revival. Ironically, I'm actually wearing the same shirt in that study. <laughs> I don't have my suspenders on back then, but, uh, you know, that's I did that thing probably over a year ago. Yeah, it would, it would have been over a year ago. And the whole point of that sermon is, you know, there are different types of revival in the Bible, and one of the dangers of revival is that you actually, when you get saved, your old man dies, that old sinful man dies, and you are now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And you have to be very careful not to resurrect that old man, not to revive that old man. So there's a, actually a dangerous type of revival. But you see here that thing again, of put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the, to the deceitful lusts, lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do you renew the spirit of your mind? Let me give you a hint. That's how. There's never a time when you say, you know what, I've read the Bible enough, I think I got it now. Uh, no, that doesn't happen. You want to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So, very important there. But now let's look at uh, verse 25 through 28. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, 
that he may have to give to the, him that needeth. You say, Brian Denlinger teaches uh, lordship salvation. He teaches work salvation because he says that there's supposed to be a changed life that accompanies salvation. I say that for one reason. The Bible says it. We just read it. Right there. That him that stole, steal no more. He has to have a new life. A new life in Christ Jesus. See? When you get truly converted, it isn't that I'm truly converted now, so I'm going to do all these changes in my life. No, no. You get truly converted, God's Holy Spirit comes upon you and says, this is the way you're going to live. That's what true conversion is. Not these people just coming out and saying, I prayed a prayer and therefore I'm in. That's not true conversion. And you look at their life, nothing changes. Nothing happened. They have not put on the new man. And I'm talking, of course, years and years and years after their supposed conversion. Watch out for that stuff. But look at uh, verse 29 now. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Okay? You need to be very careful about the kind of language that you use as a Christian. You say, why is that? Well, turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 73. Matthew 26, verse 73 through 75 says here, And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bewrayeth thee. See that? Just stop there. Thy speech bewrayeth thee. What kind of speech was, was Peter using? He was talking like a saved man. Probably saying, well, I thank the Lord for this, or I, I, you know, I praise God for this, or God showed me that, or whatever. His speech actually betrayed him. Look at the verse 74. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. So, what was happening there? Paul, or, yeah, Paul. Peter was mad at the Lord because he thought they were going to fight, they were going to bring in the kingdom, everything else. Jesus said, Put up your sword. And he's going, You just told us to sell our garments and buy one. You know, what's going on here? I draw my sword, I'm ready to fight for you. And you say, Put it away. You know, and, and he's mad. And so what's he do? He's not denying the Lord because he's scared. He's denying the Lord because he's mad at him. That's the whole issue there. And people are like, oh, you know, you sound like a Christian. You look like one. You kind of, I think that you're probably one of these, maybe not a Christian because they weren't called Christians until Acts chapter 11. But, you know, they thought this guy looks like a saved man. And Peter was mad and he said, oh, you want proof that I'm not saved? I don't, I don't know him. I don't know Jesus. I want to prove it to you. And he began to curse and swear. See? That was a problem. See, he had corrupt communication proceeding out of his mouth. Turn next to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verse 8 through 12. But the tongue can no man tame, it is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain sweet send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. All right. Um, that's why it's very important for you to control your speech as a Christian. Uh, there's no such thing as Christian cursing. If you're cursing, it's not becoming of you as a Christian. I didn't say if somebody swears or lets a word drop or whatever else that they automatically are disqualified from being truly saved. I didn't say that. Uh, there are some people that have a hard time cleaning up their speech. There are some people that you watch profanity and filthiness so much on YouTube or on television or wherever that 
all of a sudden you find a word coming out of your mouth and you think, you know, why, you know, where on earth did that come from? I shouldn't have said that. A very, very serious thing to think about there. Go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Okay, Ephesians 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day, unto the day of redemption. Um, one of the best verses right there on the subject of eternal security. Okay, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. So, don't worry about it. Don't worry about losing your salvation. Now, if you mess around with sin, you're going to lose rewards, you're going to lose your testimony, you can even lose your life. Um, and sin is all negative. All sin is negative. So, if you're messing around with sin, you're only hurting yourself. But something that's very important to understand from that verse is you can grieve God's Holy Spirit there. You know, how would you feel if you turned me on sometime and I said, hey, I said, I got a good joke to tell everybody out there. And I told some really, really filthy, dirty joke and then laughed about it. You know, and then I reach and say, hold on, I got to get something to drink. And I reach up and I get a big can of beer or something like that, open it up and start drinking it. And, and I'm getting drunk on the camera and stuff like that. Would that grieve you? Would you see me as a fellow brother in Christ and say, why would he do that? That's such a bad testimony. Why would he do a thing like that? Yeah. How do you think the Lord feels when he sees a Christian messing around like that? Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. That's what we're supposed to keep in mind. Verse 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Interesting because this chapter here, chapter 4, kind of starts out similar to the way it ends up. Talking about keeping the unity, keeping peace among the brethren there. Very important. And you know, Remember, always keep in mind what the Lord did for you, how He forgave your sins. And then remember, you need to have some grace for some of the brethren when they sin against you. That's very important. So, that is going to be it for this week, for this study here of Ephesians chapter 4. Next week we will be in Ephesians chapter 5. So, let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, so much for your word. I thank you for all the promises of your word, Lord, all the encouraging things that we can read, and for the fact that uh, this life isn't it. Um, we will have eternity to look forward to, and uh, everything's going to be straightened out then, Lord. But I just really pray that you would please help uh, all the people out there listening to this sermon to um, just be challenged, Lord, and and to live their life differently than the lost world, and, and to get firmly grounded in your word so that they aren't like a child that's blown about with every wind of doctrine. And uh, I just ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. A little uh, out of it right now. Sorry about that. i am <laughs> got a really bad headache again, and... and uh, this seems to be part of, of life. It won't be when I get to be with the Lord, so uh, that's why I'm gonna. It motivates me. You know, the Bible talks about it. Uh, my strength is make, made perfect in weakness, and so it motivates me to try to get people saved because the when the fullness of the the stature of Christ there is is completed, then we're leaving, and say goodbye to this wicked ridiculous world <laughs> and getting more wicked and more ridiculous all the time uh, just unreal some of the stuff you hear anymore but um, that's going to be it for this study and uh, please keep us in your prayers um, have a couple things to do yet before uh, winter um, 
officially comes, although right now here in this area of Maine where we're living, uh, we are. this is November 2nd when I'm recording this, and it's snowing outside right now. Um, pretty decent little snowstorm. We already have a couple inches. It's been snowing, uh, you know, pretty decent overnight, and right now I haven't... I haven't looked in a while. I got a window here beside me. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, it's really coming down out there. So, uh, <laughs> interesting. But um, just want to thank everybody too for donations. Uh, just keeps us going. And, you know, there's a lot of people that, that uh, donate um, music CDs as well. I've had some brethren just send me a music CD and and we really do appreciate those, and and uh, I'm just really trying to f stay focused on the ministry, and that's why I don't write back a lot of times. Um, it just is it's a challenge to to balance all this stuff with, you know, just the normal duties of trying to fix this place up and and trying to just get work done and whatever else, and and um, so. Uh, thank you to everybody out there that does send things, uh, that has sent donations, that has sent uh, just all the all the neat letters of encouragement. We do appreciate that, and uh, getting a lot of uh, good sermon requests and things, and so we're going to try to keep those um, coming and everything else. So that's going to be it for this week. I don't think I really have any other announcements or anything right now to make. So I'm going to say goodbye for this week. And we will see you in next week's study when we go through Ephesians chapter 5. So thank you very much for watching.